Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome. We'll just give it a couple of seconds while, uh, when everyone finds their seats. I, I took that from, uh, from Brian Cook, one of our speakers earlier on. Plenty of seats down the front here. Okay. So uh, welcome to our monthly NRF breakfast briefing, proudly sponsored by Contracting Plus, Ireland's leading umbrella company service provider and first choice for first-time contractors. I'm Jimmy Sheehan, and I'll be your host for this morning's event. We've got two great speakers lined up this morning to educate and inform us on health, safety, well-being, all while we're working remotely. I'm going to introduce you to Mary and Brian shortly, but just before that, I was reading a lighthearted article on the five stages of remote working a few weeks ago. Uh, and I went searching for it yesterday so I could share those with you this morning, but I couldn't quite put my hand on it. So I do remember the five stages and given the topic of this morning's breakfast briefing, I thought it would be worth running through them briefly. And the first stage was optimism. And I remember that feeling, cutting down on commute times, getting to spend so much extra time with my family, maybe even stealing an extra few minutes in bed on a Monday morning. I'm sure we all remember that phase. And then next after that came the second phase, which is the, the home office setup, figuring out the best place to put yourself for a few months until all this had blown over. You know, your new desk, granted the kitchen table had been around for a while, but it was now your new desk. You know, grabbing a cup from the press for your pens, maybe you went all fancy, went into the office, grabbed a second screen from your office, borrowed some stationery, and now we're all ready to go and we're working away. And then stage three was uh, was getting distracted. You know, the kids, the fridge, the fridge, you know, the uniqueness of it all. And there was there was definitely distractions, you know, and, and in fairness, jumping from no video calls a day to six hours of video calls a day, we, we needed that distractions phase. And it didn't last long before total frustration, you know, kind of entered into the fray. And it's like, am I on? No. Put your microphone, your microphone, it's on the left. Can you hear me? I can see you. I can't hear you. And like, we, we still have days like that. And then you get the little knock on the door, you know, and it's like, sorry, one, one second, please, one second. Yes, love? Yeah. Just let me finish this call, please. I'll be right with you. You know, and, and, you know, the homeschooling. Oh, for the love of God, open the schools. And we all had different frustrations in our life. But then finally... Uh, came the late night and the weekend shifts, you know, and finding yourself working in the evening when, when really you should have been switched off or spending time with family or even sleeping. And we've all been there. And that's why I think today's session is so important. It's to help us understand why we should, why we must have good policies for, for health, for safety and well-being. We're shortly going to hear from Brian Crook, who's a well-being educator. But before that, our first speaker needs, needs little introduction. Mary Siri Kearney is always a fountain of knowledge at these NRF events, and I'm really looking forward to learning from her this morning. She's a practicing barrister and she specializes in employment and privacy law. She has qualifications in law, psychology, and most recently, a certificate in artificial intelligence from Oxford University. She's also the data protection officer for the NRF, and she sits on the World Employment Confederation Task Force on Privacy and AI Implementation. Now, if that's not enough to keep her busy, Mary's also director of the HR Brief, a company she owns with her husband, David, and they provide outsourced HR, industrial relations and privacy compliance. Finally, what I recently learned about Mary is she's a Fine Gael senator and party spokesperson on children, disability, equality, integration and privacy rights. I was going to ask her what she does in her spare time, but clearly she doesn't have any. Mary, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jenny. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, I think you're very true words. Uh, thank you for the introduction and greetings from the, the plush surroundings of Leinster House here this morning. Um, I think in, in the in the years to come, 10 years from now, when Reeling in the Years is playing, um, we'll have all the seriousness and the horror of COVID and the levity in that, in that programme will be um, somebody saying, you're on mute. So well done, Jimmy. Um, okay, so good morning. Uh, you're you're very welcome. I'm dealing with the uh, the very I suppose the the mundane of it, and Brian gets the the very exciting, fluffy, lovely bits. So that's why they put me first. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you, and um, just to 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 go through a number of slides and so that we can chat and I'll just reduce that. So I'm not looking at myself and I'm, I'm getting to look at you. Uh, so good morning. Um, what what we're, we're doing here, I, I suppose, is looking at remote working a year on. 
the, the first thing maybe to say on it is there's a real difference between remote working and working from home. And my, my colleague in the Shannon, uh, Senator Ian McCurry, would kill me if I if I didn't make that distinction. And um, remote working is something that we've probably been doing for a while. And I know that as I did GDPR and privacy rights with companies, uh, I found uh, I had to deal with with issues like remote working where where recruiters met their uh, potential candidates, they maybe met them out in a Costa Coffee in Newbridge or, you know, they meet them out. So people have been working remotely uh, for quite some time. But now we're under we're under the obligation from government to work from home, and and in the in the future we the government in January published the national remote working strategy, and in that context the, the perspective was that we would um, we would have a system where we would have official remote working, recognizing the need for flexibility in the workplace, recognizing that it there are there are real benefits to it from an employer point of view in that you can have different people um, access the labor market, you can widen the talent pool because if you can facilitate remote working, then you can have someone in Donegal working for your office in Dublin. Um, and then there's all of the other ancillary benefits of carbon emissions, reduced, reduced travel time, uh, balanced regional development, people being able to live and move back down to their, their home and their, their village um, and, and live rurally uh, uh, as long as, as they can and, and still tune into the office. So a lot of what I'm going to say this morning is dealing with um, the working from home reality, but has implications for that remote working. So it may be that your office will set up a satellite hub that people come in and hot desk at. It may be that they'll work from home. It may be that they'll come in two or three days a week when, when our restrictions and the current uh, restriction and obligation to work from home is lifted. Um, so I suppose it is, it is important to say remote working hopefully will be a, an adaptable, agile way of working that will be with us when COVID is over. But for now, we have to work from home. Um, in early, I suppose in, in, in early in January, on the 15th of January this year, uh, there was a decision by the Workplace Relations uh, Commission on the entitlement to remote work at the moment during COVID. Um, and so I will deal with that on its own uh, on its own merits later on. Uh, looking at uh, the sort of things that I'm gonna deal with, I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, productivity and motivation, the culture and isolation. I'll do those um, at the end because they'd be a good segue into Brian's piece. Uh, and then looking at best practice of remote working, policy compliance, cybersecurity and insurance, the sort of things that you have got to give consideration to. So beginning with, first of all, I suppose, with the, the health and safety end of things, um, we, we need to, to have a look. What are the things that has to be considered uh, for health and safety? As an employer right now, even though it is a government requirement that your employees work from home where at all possible, your employees and you as an employer still have to comply with all of the health and safety requirements. So while if there was a, a case and we were looking down the road at personal injuries case, if there was a situation like that, you may um, get mitigation, the fact that there was a sudden move to working from home. But in actual fact, in the here and now, um, we've been working from home for a year, so there would no longer be any excuse or tolerance uh, for a, a move away from health and safety standards and the health and safety standards that would have to be in place uh, for, for being able to work from home and, and on the part of, uh, of the employer and the requirements of the employer. So I'm just going to bring you quickly through those. So looking at it, at first of all, um, this, the, the risk assessment aspect of it. So first of all, you've got to consider what are the risks associated with your employees carrying out their work from their home at the moment. So there, there are basic things that you've got to consider. The surroundings, what is the environment like? Are they are they house sharing? Or do they have six children? There, there's information now that you're going to need to gather about the employee um, in the context of their, their working from home environment um, to ensure that, well, are you, are you putting burdensome expectations on them way beyond what, what they can cope with in the, in the here and now? But, from the job itself, you've got to consider the, the risk assessment of what equipment is needed for your employee to carry out their work. Do they have an appropriate workstation? You know, is the kitchen table okay? Is it 
is it rockety? Is it, you know, do they need a new one from Ikea? Um, do they have a suitable chair? If they're going to spend long hours in, in the chair, is the chair suitable? Is it going to cause them um, back aches? Is it going to cause issues like that? Is their screen at a suitable height? So it's all the ergon ergonomics has to have to still be considered. Um, then, uh, you know, are they, are they, uh, trained in manual handling? Have you told them about posture? Have you ensured that they're taking breaks, that they're standing up, walking around? Um, what's the heating and ventilation like? You know, the, the, we have the, the advertisement on the, on, at, at the moment that's saying, uh, you know, I think he's frozen. No, he's really frozen. And that's about the heating bills at the moment. But really, that's a reality in people's lives. Uh, are they able to keep the heating on? Are they stuck in a house where they can't afford it? Is it cold? Is it? So there, there are other things that you've got to consider the capacity and, and capability of, of the of the working environment. Do they have sufficient ventilation? Do they have electricity? Do they, you know, is there, are, what sort of, are that what sort of burning up of electricity um, and broadband usage and all of that that goes with it. So you've got to consider those implications. Then last of all, are they plugging in a load? Do they have a load of, of extension leads on top of extension leads on top of extension leads, all stuck under a little desk besides boxes of files from work um, that are potentially a fire hazard? So they're things that you need to address and you need to stay state to people as obvious as they are. OK, things you've got to consider is insurance. You know, have you informed your insurance company about people working from home? Have you informed um, has your employees insurance company where that they're working from home and at their home address, there may be equipment belonging to the company and um, that there are physical, intellectual property belonging to the company is now at a, at a particular address. Uh, so there are considerations that you've got to consider in the context of risk assessment and notifying your insurers. Moving on to employment rights. So what are the, the, the rights of employees in the here and now? Well, well, first of all, the place of work has changed if people are working from home. So if they always came into an office in Dublin too, that was that was fine. It was they were they had a place to to move from if they had to go out and visit client premises. Then there is a mileage basis from where to calculate from. So there are considerations like that in the in the basic terms of the contract of employment that need consideration um, it, right now of what is their place of work? How are you managing that? If they do have to do client visits, if if you are involved in, in a health and safety end, if there is something that you have to physically show up at, at a premises um, of a client's premises, what are what are you what, how are you managing that from a mileage point of view? Because the, the revenue commissioner is obliged that you're you're stating mileage from the per, first point of contact of work or the first place of work in, in the morning. So so just give them some sort of consideration to that. Give considerations to hours of work. It is important that people are still only working the hours of work that they um, that they are obliged to do on, in accordance with their contract. At the moment, uh, the, the research that is, has has occurred over the last while and has been monitoring, it would appear that people are working um, much more, much much longer hours. Uh, that they are working, they're not switching off. Uh, so there'll be legislation coming through later this year on the obligation to switch off. But um, but it, it so it is it is important that you are monitoring that in the same way as you would do, and under the Organisation of Term, Time, um, Time Act, that you have an obligation still to ensure that people are only working um, the hours that they should be, and that they're getting their their rest breaks. So there is an obligation. Normally, we would have flown into a pattern if people were working full time to take an hour for the lunch or maybe you have a morning break and an afternoon break and a short break but there are obligations in law to ensure that people are taking rest breaks and a rest break is that they are completely able to switch off that they're not obligated to be having an email coming in and having to answer that so it's important that you say are you taking your rest break you're not to answer emails during that you're not to be following the the company whatsapp you're not to be doing things like that that you're you're making sure that the rest break is a true rest break in accordance with the definition in law you need to be keeping records that people are taking breaks and are keep only working the hours that they're that they're doing and um, so your obligation um, to the Workplace Relations Commission 
is no less. And they are still carrying out inspections. Um, as difficult as you might have thought that to be and impossible at the moment, I know we're consulting with a number of companies uh, at the moment, assisting them through their workplace relations inspection. And while things are being done virtually, they are still ongoing and they are no less demanding. So you need to, you need to make sure that you're adhering to those. Um, online uh, time checks. So it's possible, you know, that you're, if you're connecting in with people, uh, that, that, that you're respecting their privacy, that if uh, some employers that I've, I've come across in the last year are obliging people to have, be on Zoom, camera on all of the time while they are working. Um, so there are, you've got to consider that the privacy implications of that is there a child coming in and out, you know, not all of the children are back at school, early teenagers aren't back at school yet. So you've got to consider all of those things. Make sure the people are taking public holidays and annual leave. We don't have the same structure in the week. We don't have the same sense of the weekend anymore. So I think work is spilling over into weekend and people are, are doing that. Be careful. We've got a, we've got public holidays coming up now. Be careful that people are taking annual leave. It's okay to oblige them to take their annual leave. What you don't want is that we suddenly open up the country, um, you know, six months into the year and, and everything is open again as it was last summer. And there is this back um, backlog of annual leave of 20 days to be taken between for people who are working full time between then and the end of the year. So maybe as your bill, as your work and your momentum is increasing later on this year, the people have a whole heap of holidays to take. So you want to make sure that they're taking it in accordance. By now, we're, we're through the end of the first quarter of the year yeah, and just coming to the end of that normally people would have had a couple of holidays around Patrick's Day, you know, or will be taking holidays around Easter and around school breaks. And, and they may be managing that differently now that they're working from home. So, so just watch that, watch, watch, I suppose, anticipate your own business needs later in the year if people are coming back into the office. There are still the same entitlements to maternity, paternity, parental and adoptive leave. As of next week, there's going to be a new leave called parents leave that will be a five week leave paid leave by the state and um, applicable to both parents or the spouses of biological parents, uh, the cohabitees of, of biological parents. So that's a, a new entitlement that's coming in. So you need and, and that will be retrospective up to the child is two years old. So it may be that people who had babies early last year uh, or since November 2019 that they will now be entitled to this parents' leave and maybe using that accordingly. All of the usual, um, around those leaves, all of the usual requirements of in accordance with and with the, the employer's requirements apply. But obviously maternity and paternity uh, are entitlements in law and they come first and foremost. Make sure you're looking at your Payment of Wages Act and um, that you are paying wages bonuses where they accrue, uh, that all of those um, those considerations are in place, uh, that you're not um, missing out on paying people their Sunday premium if they are working on a Sunday, that you are not, or that, that there else, that there is a contractual clause that includes a Sunday premium. Um, make sure that you're, you're sending out pay slips properly. Uh, if there was a time when people got them into their pigeonhole or onto their desk, if you're sending them um, via in electronic means, make sure that they're encrypted, make sure that there's a password on it. Uh, so, it so ensure that you have that. And make sure that you have that right to disengage, that you have a verified provable case that you instructed employees on their right to disengage and their right not to send, not to reply to an email. You know, I, it's really important that when you're sending out emails now, that if they're outside of office hours, if you're working outside of office hours, and um, that if you uh, are sending an email, that in, in that context, you are um, saying, I don't expect you to reply to this until tomorrow. Make sure that you do that just to cover yourselves. Policy compliance, I suppose, just an important thing to say is your employees are still obligated to abide by the policies and staff handbook, even though they're working from home. So that's all sorts of things. That's as simple as that they're suitably attired for work. It's not okay to be shown up in a sweatshirt or in your pajamas and, um, you know, things like that, that you're maintaining that professional standard. There is something about the, the, the putting on of work clothes that, that is a ritual of going into a work in a professional space. 
that creates boundaries around how people engage with others in their workplace. Um, because there is a, a danger of bullying and there has been an increased uh, reporting of bullying in the last year where people are getting casual in regard to what they put into the company WhatsApp group, what they will say to each other, how they'll dismiss each other, how they will, because now suddenly they can see into each other's homes and um, that there is commentary on that. There's commentary between work colleagues about other work colleagues. So just be really concerned, really, uh, I suppose on top of that, be reminding people of their requirement to stay within a professional code of conduct. Their behavior on social media is no less than, you know, your right to the integrity and the reputation of your company on social media doesn't become any less because people are at home and working. And there are things of employment equality, you know, there are nine protected categories there uh, on gender, disability, uh, membership of the traveler community, and um, sexual orientation, you know, sex, gender, sexual identity, all of those things still need to be, they are still actionable claims against the company if as employers that we're not ensuring that those, that's proper standards, professional standards are being um, are being abided by. We, we've had a, an, an interesting, and I suppose I'll, I'll come on to cyber safety, but and uh, there, there's reports in the newspaper, the Times has an article this morning on Castlenock College, where a, a complaint came into the past pupils union about a, a sexual abuse complaint, a historical sexual abuse complaint. And that email ended up being forwarded to everyone in the past pupils union. It was a human error. Uh, but it disclosed the name of the complainant and the name of the respondent, the person is accused. That has a whole heap of ramifications to any legal case or anything otherwise, as well as defamation potential. Um, but that's where there's a slippage, there's a slippage of professional standards that maybe wouldn't, there, there is something about the ritual of going into the workplace. There's something about all of that that maybe puts people in a different mindset. There's a potential for a, a, a looser and more casual mindset when people are working from home. So just be mindful of that. Remote working as an entitlement in the current climate. So I suppose I, I would put the caution over over this this case that was uh, that happened back in January and um, a, a decision of the Workplace Relations Commission in relation to. So it was a, an operations coordinator and a facilities management service provider. In that in in that case, the the complainant um, said that she needed to work from home. And the employer said, absolutely not, it's not possible, it's not whatever. And um, she produced photographic evidence of the lack of adherence to, uh, to proper standards and social distancing standards, PPE, et cetera. She produced photographic evidence of that to uphold the, the, her belief that the employer wasn't compliant. Um, and in all of it, they, uh, they, they upheld a, a, a constructive dismissal. Because they wouldn't let her work from home, she had to resign. She sued them for a constructive dismissal and won. Now, there's a few things about that. First is, it may be a, a confined to COVID and not the absolute entitlement to, to work from home. So we're, we're, my, we're careful of that. Uh, however, there are inspections of workplaces. There are, there are things that we're going to have to negotiate in the coming back to work. You know, as the vaccines, what, how are you going to manage with people that are anti-vax? How are you going to manage with people who won't, won't, have, uh, won't wear face masks? Um, so what infrastructure do you have in place when you are bringing people back into the workplace, albeit for a limited period of time, when you're transitioning from home working to working back in the workplace? These are considerations that you've got to put in, put in place and consider that are under the health and safety um, safety uh, heading. Okay, so things that you must do. You must have uh, a home or a remote working policy. You should have had a remote working policy if you have people like that meeting clients or meeting candidates in Costa Coffees uh, and 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 going even going out to clients and um, you and maybe doing an email from the car or an email from their home uh, from their phone. And um, so you should have had a remote working policy in place anyway since GDPR came into place. Because what are people hotspotting? Are they going on Wi-Fi? Were they going on Wi-Fi? Of hotels was were there things like that so you need to have a, a remote working policy in place it needs to deal with 
what is appropriate, what are standards of privacy, um, what you expect from the perspective of the surroundings, um, and then you will need to prove that you've trained people in that remote working policy. And um, then you've got to also make sure, do they know how to use the equipment? Do they know how to, do they have impediments um, with regard to it? So for instance, I, I'm here in Leinster House, I'm supplied with the laptop. That laptop is got state level, you know, encryption and the devil and all on it. When I'm at home, if I need to print an email, I've got to forward it to my own address, um, my non-Oroctus address, to be able to print it because you can't print it from anything outside of Oroctus um, uh, standard uh, printer where everything is all, you know, hyper secure. Uh, but that is that is a point, and I suppose it's been a real learning for me um, in in speaking to companies and dealing with companies. Of do they have the same access to printers? Do they, what is the implications? Can they print from the company email onto the printer? What happens with the printout? Does it get left on the kitchen table for anybody else that's house sharing to see it? And um, what are they doing with the, with the computer? Are they accessing porn? Are they accessing child porn? Um, and, and I mean, they're, that, they're pretty horrific things to say, but this, this happens. And so you need to watch people's, you know, are they putting their personal social media on their company laptop? Are they using uh, that from a from very practical point of view? There will be a reputational damage if uh, if a situation like that arose. And believe me, it has. I have been both the investigator in these cases and I have been the, the chair of disciplinary proceedings in these cases since GDPR especially has come into place. So these things happen and they happen with an increased regularity that you would be really surprised at. Um, so, as, so just be careful what, what's being done with your your company's computer while it's being used in the work in the, uh, in the working from home environment and um, because if the guard you raid for child porn that's your computer and everything that's stored on it taken by the guard is evidence and um, so so you've got to consider that making sure that people know what they can and cannot do on the work computer what they are not allowed and absolutely prohibited and what is an immediate sackable offense Communications and meetings, I suppose, just think about Zoom calls, you know, uh, any and teams, any of those environments, they need to be limited time meetings, whoever's chairing them needs to be really robust in making sure that the one person doesn't hog it, uh, because everybody else switches off, it's easier to be distracted, or to hide that you're on your phone and doing something else while you're on a Zoom call uh, for work rather than if you were in the room as a meeting. So you may be losing the room and not aware that you're losing the room. So it's better to be have very good boundaries around the use of calls. Uh, if it is uh, just a get together social Zoom call for people to have coffee and a chit chat, that's fine. Um, but if it's for business that everybody gets in, gets out, gets the work done uh, and that are you going to record the Zoom calls? It's okay to facilitate that for meetings and whatever, but everybody needs to know they're being recorded. And um, looking at emails, looking at, at matters like that. Very quickly, just to look at equality issues, working from home and planned remote working uh, engages all sorts of things. Over the past few years, there, there are occasions when people with a disability or acquire a disability, either through an accident or an illness, and are no longer able to work. There's a whole process under employment equality law that has to be gone through before that conclusion is reached. But it is one of the dismissals that is, is deemed to be fair in employment law if somebody is unable to. However, what once would have been a job that couldn't absolutely have happened from home may now have to have them proven in the last year that it is able to be done from home. And so future claims uh, where a disability arises, um, future claims may, may, may need to be given reasonable accommodation, which is the legal term from it, and um, need to be given reasonable accommodation um, uh, and greater consideration of that. So just watch, watch also discrimination in, uh, in indirect discrimination. Uh, is, it, is it more difficult for women to be working from home? Are they the primary caregiver? Is there, are there considerations like that that you've got to, you've got to give? And um, this, the circumstances of somebody's home, and um, maybe they're they're sharing with other people, maybe they have uh, they're in rather limited accommodation or difficult accommodation. Some people are living in homeless hubs. You know, there there is a whole, there's a whole range of information that we now 
have to engage with or see going on and that uh, that make it difficult for people to work from home. So so being open and having a confidential place for employees to be able to talk uh, in that. Moving on, I touched on a lot of the data, the data protection matters. Look at your own standards of data storage. Um, do you have appropriate technical and organizational measures? Are, is confidentiality and the integrity of any information you're holding is, is, re, is, is the, the, one of the, the, key, the key pillars of GDPR? So in that, you know, our, our, coming back to the very basic of you must fill in the basis, of, fill in the, the email itself first and then put in the address uh, so that people are not distracted. Because I think at home things can be, can be distracting. You're more easily distracted, as Jimmy said, by the fridge, uh, but you can be more easily distracted. So just thinking about things like that and um, thinking about, uh, and then from a practical, do you have ISO standard of data storage? If people are putting it in to the cloud where is the cloud cloud the cloud is a physical place it is um, and what is that physical place do you have a data processing agreement with that storage company where, where is your information going where has it been stored how is it being accessed by employees who has who has visibility of their screens and um, who has who, is the information going on to personal devices of necessity by now you're a year on that should really have been resolved and um, it shouldn't be sorry that's me to, to, that's telling me that I'm at the 25 minutes so apologies um, and are they accessing software so looking at what what is this the remote security are you using encrypted devices it's really important and um, looking at the background you know uh, it, it's fascinating for me going into into uh, committee meetings here where you see into other people's offices because all of the the joint directors committees are done from everyone's offices you get to see what their plans are on their board people don't think about what's behind them so you've got to think about things like that is there is there any tells of your company confidential information that's being given away uh, um so so looking at the, the suitability of where you're working from is really important my last two are how are you measuring productivity and motivation you know how are you is it are the KPIs suited to working from home and all the complexity of that environment right now? Um, are you communicating? Are you encouraging? Um, are you appreciating the effort of people? Are you communicating well with them? Make sure that everything isn't in writing um, because emails can be read depending on your mood. So the same line can be in, 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 in an email and I read it with a happy face. I read it with a sad face. I read it with a stressed and anxious um, mood. Uh, it can be interpreted in a different way, exactly the same words. So make sure that you're not relying on, on written information all of the time. And then lastly, and this is this leads nicely into, into, into Brian, um, looking at isolation, looking at um, the, the, the people working in, even when they come back to work, it's much more likely that people will work in a, in a much more isolated sense, because we will be with this will be with us for time. Masks and all of that will all be with us for for a, a good period of time. And um, making sure that you're trusting your employees, that you're checking in with them, you're not checking up on them. They're really important things to look at. And last, being looking at work life balance, uh, safeguarding against overwork, uh, and and um, you know what supports do you have in place? You should have a well being policy. You should have a system now. You should have, at the very least people should be supplied with uh, contact telephone numbers uh, for support services. Um, so there, there are things that you're providing out so that employees feel they can reach out. Thankfully, in the last year, it's been more acceptable to talk about mental health. Um, and, and mental health is really the one that is most fractured uh, in the last year. So, uh, so ensuring that you have those supports, that you're caring holistically for employees, not just about what their output is, but the, actually what your input is into them. And that's me. Done. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Mary. I'm uh, I'm frantically scribbling notes. I think one of the things I took from that uh, certainly was the the little habits that, that we ensure we still have that degree of professionalism. You know, when we maintain that dress code, the way we communicate with each other, I think that's really really important. So some really really good insights there. Thank you. Um, I've got some questions, but we're going to save these until Brian has finished speaking. If you do have questions, we'll take them in the Q&A session. There's a little box at the bottom of your screen where you can pop those in. Nobody but the panellists can see them, so don't worry about uh, the question you're asking. So to our next speaker, I'm 
uh, Crook, Brian is a well-being educator, a speaker and advisor. He empowers Irish organisations to promote and sustain well-being within their work places. He recently launched the workwellinstitute.org, which is a learning hub for workplace well-being training and education, which includes Brian's eight-step framework for developing a workplace wellness programme that lasts. He's the founder of Workplace Wellbeing Ireland Community, which you can visit at workwellireland.ie. I was actually looking at this site yesterday uh, and I thought there was a nice offering of programmes for physical health, mental health and nutritional health. So well worth a look. Brian is also the course director of the Postgrad Certificate in Workplace Wellness at Tangent at Trinity College Dublin. At Contracting Plus, we've actually hired two graduates from the Tangent programme on entrepreneurship so I can speak to the quality of the Tangent courses. Uh, he might not thank me for telling you this, but Brian is also the proud father to two children, the first of whom only joined us a couple of weeks ago. So congratulations, Brian. As a dad of four myself, I know there's no spare time in life, but Brian still manages to find time to bring free resistance training to every county and community in Ireland through his park hit social enterprise. Anyone who can manage to do all that and still look so relaxed is worth listening to. Brian, you have the floor. Thanks, Jimmy, for the fantastic introduction. So I have no idea how we're going to live up to that, but I'll give it a go. And yes, thanks for Connor. So Connor's two, he joined us two weeks ago today, actually. And he's not sleeping too badly either, so I am actually managing to get some sleep in too. So good morning, everyone. And yeah, big thanks to Mary for the excellent opening segment there. I was scribbling some notes there myself, so I got a lot from that. So thank you, Mary. Uh, I can't see everyone that's on the call this morning, but Jimmy has assured me that everyone has been prepped and everyone's ready now. You're in your workout clothes there for our well-being, for the segment, the well-being segment this morning. So now I'm going to get to the burpees and the squats and all the fun stuff in just a few moments, okay? Before I do, I have a question for everyone. And we can use, let's use the, uh, the chat functionality down below here for this. Um, here's the question. What does well-being mean to you? I'm not looking for a definition here. I'm looking for your own opinion. On the 25th of March, 2021, what does well-being mean to you? So just take a moment or two there to think about that and pop some, uh, maybe it's a word, maybe it's a couple of words. I'm seeing a few coming in here already. Maybe it's a sentence. So just take a moment or two there, which is great. I'm seeing a few words pop in here already. <clears throat> Think happiness, feeling good feeling healthy both physically and mentally, a healthy state of mind, survival, just popped up their balances in there, balance and quality of life, no stress, positivity, happiness in your own being. Let me see some new uh, ones coming. Happiness, content in life and work is in a contentment in there again, a balance between work and home life, that's balance is coming up a few times, zen, Donald Donahue there with the, with the Zen. Great stuff. Just one, one more moment there. I'll see a few more coming in. Anxiety free. There's another one. Interesting. Keeping fit and healthy and keeping stress at bay. Internal, medical, me mental, and spiritual balance in there. Physical, mental, and spiritual. Combination of mindfulness, self care, food, and drink. Excellent. Okay, excellent. So, Great, great, I can't see everybody. Sunshine, fresh air, mountains, green fields. Love that one. That's fantastic. Okay, so so great mix in there. Fantastic response. So thanks to everyone for coming back on that. So I mean, well, what have we learned from that? And the first thing I would say to you, the first point is, whatever you put in there, well, whatever words you use, whatever you're thinking, are you doing something every day to bring you to that, to do that place? That's what well-being means to you, because if you're not, then why not? Why aren't you working towards that, doing something every day to bring you to bring it towards that? And not someone else's interpretation of what well-being means, the, the definition which everyone can look up, your own interpretation of what well-being means. So there's the first point. Do something that brings you towards what well-being means to you. I think the second point to make on that is well-being is quite broad, isn't it? It's it's certainly, I didn't see burpees mentioned in there, for example. I certainly didn't see squats. So our definition of, of well-being is incredibly broad. But different uh, well-being means different things to different people. So if we're considering, you know, from an organizational perspective, 
you know, a, a bowl of fruit here and there and uh, you know yoga yoga is fantastic a yoga class here and there that's probably that's not going to cover off you know even one percent of what we saw in the feedback there and then i see 79 to 80 people online here there's maybe 20 25 people contributing there imagine them even a much larger organization the workplace well-being is challenging it's particularly challenging uh, so you know those one-off initiatives random acts of wellness what I talk, I'm trying to get away from all those random acts of wellness. It's more about, as Mary hint, uh, spoke about, a policy, an operating plan, listening to the needs and wants of our people, just like I've done here very quickly, understand exactly what well-being is and try and, and then as an organization, try and work towards that. Third point I would say then is, uh, I guess there's great fear and uncertainty. And we've, we've all kind of uh, realized that over the last, over the last year, certainly. But on the flip side, then there's great comfort in certainty, and and with that in mind, I'm just going to share my screen here now. Give me one moment, you should be able to see my slides now. So we had a question. Uh, what have we learned? We're discussing that now. So with, with that, uh, with the comfort in certainty, here, here's the certainty. I certainly take great comfort in this from a well-being perspective. I wrote this article, five building blocks to a healthy and productive day at least five years ago. I, I revisited one year ago, almost one year ago to the day, exa exa um, actually, to see did it still make sense from a remote perspective? Do these five building blocks still make sense from a, a remote well-being perspective? And the answer is yes, they do. Uh, and we'll go through them now. I, I, again, use the chat there, please. Anyone, uh, what would you put down for this? These were my five building blocks to a healthy and productive day. What would you say were, were included here? So five building blocks that help me get the most out of my day for, from a health perspective and from a productivity perspective. Let's see if uh, I've given the, the cat is out of the bag there now. Trying to bring up the chat while uh, managing this. Now, here we go. Good sleep. Okay, I've seen sleep. Excellent. Good, good job, Oshin. That's number one for me. Uh, planning. Love it, Trish. I've got preparing. The eat well is in twice. And I've got nutrition in. Okay, routine is coming in there. Actually, so I think you've pretty much covered off most of them, right? So here's the, here's the certainty piece I'm talking about. Even though we're, we're remote working now, okay, we're not in the office and circumstances have changed, no question. But we still need the same amount of sleep per day. That hasn't changed. Whether we're seven, we need seven, is it eight, is it nine? That hasn't changed. We still need to fuel our bodies with good quality, nutritious food. That hasn't changed. And I call it movement here. Movement being it's, it's physical, it's, it's exercise plus movement. So we need a little bit of exercise. But we also need regular movement throughout the day, especially if we're sitting through six hours of, of Zoom calls. Um, and the, move, the movement piece, it's, it's, you know, we're talking about maybe every 30 to 45 minutes where possible, uh, stretch the legs, five minutes, uh, walk up and down the stairs, that kind of thing. But on top of it, a little bit of exercise as well. If you have a standing desk, we're talking, Mary was talking about the equipment and, and workstations. I invested recently enough in a, in a standing desk, and it's one of the best investments I've ever made. I don't stand all day, but I mix up my day. A bit of sitting, a bit of standing, uh, plenty of movement, get, get a nice burst of exercise in early in the morning. So movement really important. And the physical activity guidelines, 4X for healthy adults, they haven't changed in the last year either. I'm sure people on the call will know what they are. Give me a quick shout out there in the chat. Physical activity guidelines for healthy adults. It's so that these are come from the World Health Organization. Plus, Healthy Ireland has pretty much have adopted the identical uh, guidelines. Give me a shout out there in the chat if you know what they are. I'm seeing hydration in there from Emma as well. The routine. So it's at least saying yeah, 30 minutes per day. You might have seen that uh, also uh, advertised as 150 minutes uh, per week, uh, something like that. That's the car, so that's that's the minimum as well. That's also the cardio um, recommendation. The same guidelines for whatever reason, it's it's not given the same kind of attention. Is we need two res a minimum of two resistance sessions per week. So that's anything that helps our bones, our joints, our muscles. And it's a bit more challenging now. The gyms are closed, but it's not all about the gym work. Uh, yoga, Pilates, light stretching. That's all resistance work, and that's where that was, it's actually the basis of my park hit social enterprise that Jimmy mentioned there as well. It's all about promoting the importance of resistance exercise. So it might, might, might feel like great comfort at the moment, but the, those guidelines haven't changed. We should, we should still be aiming uh, for those kind of minimum requirements in terms of our activity. 
Uh, it's been more challenging, I admit, with the, the 5K, of course, and, and the gyms, but it's still, it is still possible. The hydration piece, are we getting enough fluids throughout the day, especially water? And I used to call the last one, I used to call that stress less, and that's easier said than done. Uh, so, but I changed this uh, to a bit more personal thing to prepare. So, am I prepared for this meeting that's coming up today? Am I prepared for my working day? These are things that help me stress less. Uh, am I prepared for, for my exercise in the morning? You know, if I don't have my gear out and ready and just pretty much to jump into so I don't even have to think about it, I'm probably not going to, I'm not going to get to it straight in the morning. And then with two kids now and a newborn, it's just not going to happen uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, so that preparation, meal prep as well, also really important. So there are my five building blocks. Another question for you now, a lot of heavy lifting for you here this morning, guys. What's missing from, the, from these building blocks? So as I said, I wrote these five years ago. I was in a different, I'd recently graduated, I'd done it at night, I qualified as a personal trainer as well. So I was in a very um, particular frame of mind. Let's see if I can bring this up. Connect, personal connection, uh, attitude, friendship, meditation, social interaction, love it, mental health, interaction again, relaxation, connecting with others, loving this. Interacting with people, yeah, we're, we're, we're missing that. I'm time with family, communication, I'm seeing a few themes kind of being repeated here. I think you've pretty much covered off what I, what I was looking for here. So, as I said, I was in, this is apart from the, arguably the last point, the preparation point or the stress less point. I was, these are all pretty much related to physical well being, your sleep, your nutrition, even your hydration, and obviously your movement. That's all, they're all physical, very physical. And as we, we saw from our exercise, didn't we? I mean, how broad was, was all the responses to what well-being is? There was, certainly was a little bit of uh, fitness in there. That kind of stuff, sleep was mentioned, I think. Uh, so that was uh, a bit of hydration, I think, or so. So that was, was certainly mentioned. But I would say the vast majority did not uh, touch on these points. So yeah, I was, miss I was definitely missing something. And while we know well-being is broad, I'm, I'm a recovering uh, project manager. So I still need just a little bit of structure uh, even though I know that it's broad and you, know, you can't put it in, in one or two buckets. But if we follow the World Health Organization, again, have three pillars of well-being. And I'm sure you know these. We've probably pretty much touched on them already uh, this morning in your, in your feedback there. Three pillars being the physical, which I would say, argue my the five building blocks to a productive day are predominantly in that physical space. But what I was missing then, where, where's the mental well-being piece, the support there? Where's that social well-being, often overlooked? Uh, but certainly not in the last year. That's something we've been really missing, isn't it? That interaction, uh, that connection with people, with family, with friends, with colleagues. So that's one that's kind of come to the fore in the, in the, last, in the last year or so. And these pillars, the, these, these pillars weren't put together in the last year. They've been around for quite a while from the World Health Organization. So, so these are our pillars. So now I'm getting more of a broader picture here of well-being. So I, I spent some time, well, how can I... So my, my, my five building blocks are still very valid, but I need to broaden things out here, but I'm not covering all the bases. Is there a framework? Is there a methodology out there that covers all these bases in, in a simple way, in a really simple way? I'm not looking for something that, you know, just do these 327 things before breakfast and you'll have a, you'll have a healthy day kind of thing. I'm looking for something really simple for individuals, for leaders, and given my own, what I, the work I do, how is, is this something I can use for organizations as well? And there's one tool out there that I'm, I imagine you've heard. Have you heard of the five ways to well-being? Let me know if you've heard of it or not. An internationally recognized framework. It grew out of the New Economic Forum in 2008, uh, adopted, by, adopted by a lot of well-being uh, organizations globally, particularly in the mental well-being space. Um, let me just check the chat here. Yeah, so, so, so Evelyn has heard of it, yeah, fantastic. Okay, so the five ways, and what I love about the five ways is there's no cost. I mean, you, you suppose you can go out of your way to spend money if you want, but they're really simple. They're, they support individuals, and they support us as leaders, and they support organizations. So big reveal, here they are. And we can, we can kind of draw a line to from each of these five ways to the... Uh, three pillars, if you like. So we saw the, the connect piece that came in so often in, in the chat there, the interaction, the connection, we're missing that. 
So can we go out? I look at these as like our five fruit and veg a day. Can you now, after this call, can you just, you know, every day trying, did I tick my off my five ways today? Did I do something to connect with somebody? And look how simple it is to talk, to listen, to be there, to feel connected with someone. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a colleague. Just go out of your way to give them a call, to, to check in on Zoom, that kind of idea. The active piece we've covered, we've covered quite well. A lot of that is in the five building blocks that I've mentioned. Uh, ideally, it's something that you, that you enjoy. You know, don't put yourself under, don't beat yourself up effectively if, it's, if you're not enjoying what you're doing. Just get out, get out for a walk, a little bit of fresh air and take it from there. The take notice is one I really like from an individual perspective. This is, I think this is something we all recognize maybe uh, at the beginning of the lockdown last year. How often do you hear people say they, they heard the birds singing in the local park? I certainly heard that quite often. People were taking notice of, of their surroundings for the first time in quite a while. And there's a really interesting saying that talks about, you know, if, if we're constantly in the past and thinking about the past, that's where depression exists. If we... If we're, if we're always worrying about the future and what's to come, that's where anxiety exists, where we're anxious, but where peace and calm exists is in the present moment. So I saw meditation mentioned, but if we're being a little bit more mindful, we're taking just a little bit of time out every day to remember the simple things uh, to, to appreciate. Maybe it's uh, having a mindful lunch, having a mindful few minutes. Uh, before the kids get home from school, but whatever it may be, whatever works for us, but just being present in the moment, so important. And then if, if we're leaders in an organization as well, maybe it's taking notice of your colleagues. How are they doing? How are they feeling? Um, maybe it's in terms of recognition, uh, be recognizing our, our colleagues in some way, shape or form. <clears throat> and then keep, how am I doing time-wise? Five more minutes. Keep learning, um, love to keep learning when often overlooked. Uh, from, a, from an individual perspective, we're hearing great stuff about uh, lifelong learning, and I'm, I'm absolutely one of those people. Um, are, we, are our colleagues, if, if we're a team leader, are people on our team, do they feel like they're, they're growing in their role? Do they have opportunities to grow and to learn? That's you know, often overlooked in well-being. If we feel like we're stifled and we're not learning and we're not growing, that really infects our mood and our overall well-being. So important just to ask the question of our team. Do you feel like you're learning? What are you interested in? What would you like to learn about? And can we support you with that? And then to give you just a bit more about the interaction and the connection, give your time, your words, your presence. I see Jimmy popping up there. I'll very quickly give a shout out to each of the five ways to an Irish company that I've worked with or come across that are doing interesting work in this area. Uh, the connect piece, that's AIB of their time to talk, hashtag time to talk. A virtual uh, half an hour each week where people can drop in. They've got their kind of certified um, time to talk leaders there that are there for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. Nice just uh, virtual connection piece. You can do a lot with the Be Active. The Steps challenges are fantastic. Uh, Cisco Ireland doing great work there. Here's two examples from just the last year. Uh, both of them raising money for good causes as well. Uh, this is Sinead McSweeney for the Take Notice. Uh, this is pre-COVID. She's MD of Twitter in Ireland. But she was um, kind of sick of all everyone stuck in their phone all day, especially at meetings. So a very simple rule, simple policy. No phones at meetings and no laptops unless you're presenting. That's a lot more focused meetings, a lot more positive conversations. And they've continued that then through lockdown through remote working. Uh, the, the give piece, shout out to uh, recruiters, Morgan McKinley. I actually had uh, Helen Gallagher, head of global HR, on, on the podcast just yesterday. You can listen back to that. It's at workwellpodcast.com. But Helen just had some really interesting stuff to say how they're giving back to their colleagues over the last year or so. There's such a simple things. The default, they've changed the default time of a Zoom meeting now with Morgan McKinley to 45 minutes. So they're giving everyone back just 15 minutes uh, for every single meeting. Um, they've got a standard lunch break across the company now to encourage everyone to take, I think it's 12.30 to 1.30. Block that hour out. No meetings in that time. Now, obviously, a client might pop a meeting in there but certainly Morgan McKinley are aiming to keep that one hour free for, for a walk, for lunch, for all that kind of stuff. Plus uh, 3 p.m. finishes on a Friday, which are, which are always nice. And my final, final piece then is uh, the keep learning. And it's an absolutely shameless plug for the work well community. But it's not, not really that shameless because about 90% of it is, is completely free. It's, if, you're, if you're not sick of the webinars, there's lots of video kind of backlog. Uh, there's a back catalog uh, bigger than the Beatles there. Uh, here's one on remote resilience with Dr. Eddie Murphy. 
chatting about that. Uh, there's the podcast, as I mentioned, for if you're more of an audio person, maybe something you want to listen to when you're out for a walk or doing the dishes. The community itself, the private LinkedIn group, that has, uh, if you want to ask a question about something you're interested in the welding space, uh, post it on the LinkedIn group. So yeah, all free tools. In fact, it's quite difficult to actually spend money. The only way you could is if you really want to dive deeper, and that's at the Work Well Institute. So you've got stuff like the, the eight-step framework for developing a program, and how to manage stress courses up there, the Wellbeing Champions training courses, all up there, all good stuff. Um, so but yeah, keep, keep learning is so important. Uh, I'll leave you with this slide on just five practical tips for leaders on how to actually support your team while, while, while using the five ways. Um, but yeah, five ways, think of it as your five fruit and veg per day. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an internationally recognized framework for, for promoting well-being. So listen, thanks so much for your time. I think we're going to take a few, um, a few questions. Ryan, thank you so much for that. Uh, really informative. Um, I just ask Anna to bring uh, everyone back up on, on screen there now. Um, great, super. So uh, one of the things actually, I, I think I, I was exercising every morning up until, until three weeks ago and, and I just lost the enthusiasm. And after two weeks, just two weeks, I noticed how down I felt. Everything just felt heavy. I, I, I was really cranky with my wife, my kids. And I just said, right, I'm just cutting this out and I started running again on, on Tuesday and straight away my mood was lifted and I'm back now I'm saying right I'm either running or walking every morning again it just makes such a massive difference we've a lot of questions coming in um so I'm going to get to those now we we, we have, I'll have you out of here in four minutes for those so we take a couple of quick fires so what I'll say to Mary and Brian I have a couple of questions each for you um and I, we might just do them on a, on a quick fire to try and get as many answered as possible so I'm just bringing up the uh just bring up the question box here now. Mary, the first one, um, there's a couple came in, I might throw it to you. They came in around the, you know, how or where should employers stand around people who don't want to get vaccinated and duty of care to other, their, their fellow employees and where should we sit mm -hmm. there? So re real quick answer to that is uh, that the Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Act encapsulates two duties. Uh, under Section 8 is the duty of employers, under Section 13 is the duty of employees. And everybody has to keep the work, the work environment a safe place, a safe system of working, all of that. So both, both parties have an obligation. Vaccinations just stop the, the people from needing hospitalization and getting a very serious dose. They don't stop you from getting COVID. They don't stop you from spreading COVID. So there is a justifiable reason to exclude people from the from the workplace if they are refusing to vaccinate. So that's not me being I, I am and I am uh, anti anti vaxxers but uh, but there is a justifiable reason from an employer's. I suppose I I have a head to I imagine myself down in the high court in a personal injuries claim. What has you as an employer done to make sure that you walk out of that without a successful claim taken? against you well you take action against anyone that is refusing and if they have bodily integrity they're entitled to refuse the vaccination but the vaccination doesn't stop COVID. COVID may still come into your workplace, and um, even if everybody is vaccinated. So, uh, so it, it what it just stops them from doing is getting really seriously sick. So there is a justifiable reason um, to uh, to exclude people. Um, I just, uh, Jimmy, while I'm, I have it, because uh, just two other things that I noticed there. One, happy to share the slides, no problem with that. Um, and the other is privacy and the sort of questions that I'm saying you need to, to ask your employers or your employees. And the HSA.ie, so the, the HSA website is, has on it fantastic checklists, fantastic risk assessments. They've done all of the work for you. Go in there, put in remote working, put in working from home. It'll bring you up everything you have. Just email it to your employees and ask them to fill it in. So it doesn't invade their privacy, but it shows you the standard that you, of due diligence that you have to carry out as an employer. Brilliant. Thanks, Mary. Look, we've, we've just time for one question, Brian, but I think it's an important one. How can organizations go about prioritizing well-being? So prioritize, yeah, well, I guess having leadership, having leadership on board is absolutely crucial. Um, easier said than done in some organizations. Uh, so what I would say is the, the best way to go about it is can you align what you're doing from a well-being perspective with the business objectives? So and a starting point for that might be what's, what's the uh, 
what's the organizational vision statement? What's the organization an organization's values? Can you derive a well-being vision statement from those uh, vision, from the vision and from the values? So in other words, all of a sudden well-being isn't just this fluffy thing anymore. By supporting well-being, by supporting our employees and by driving towards our well-being vision, we're actually supporting the business objectives. And so okay. that's how you get that's how you get uh, leadership attention and that's how you get them on board. Okay, brilliant. Okay, look, we're just out of time. Um, so look, it, would, it wouldn't be uh, an NRF uh, just briefing without some type of a giveaway. So what we have this morning is this. It's a work from home hamper with things like Donald Skeen's supper. We've got a Sony speaker in there. We've got some not so healthy treats. You might look away there, Brian. But um, so what I might ask you to do is if you just pick a number between, I think we've 80 people online. You pick a number between one and 80, please, Brian. So it's to me, is it? Yes, please. Oh, uh, go with number 49. 49, okay. Anna, you might take note of that. And what we'll do is we'll check who the 49th person was to register online this morning. And you will be the proud owner of that work from home hamper. All that's left to say is thank you, Mary and Brian, for your time, for sharing your knowledge with us this morning. We'll be back next month with more education and entertainment at the NRF Breakfast Briefing. Until then, stay safe. Stay healthy and thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.